very excited to, to welcome um, Dr. Uh, Jim Ludes. Uh, I didn't introduce myself to everybody. Um, I'm Michelle McGlone. I'm the, the new director of the Brookline Adult and Community Education. And um, thrilled, to, thrilled to be here and thrilled to offer this and, and very, very excited that uh, Dr. Ludes has uh, been so gracious in donating some of his time to talk with us about this very important um, issue. Uh, Dr. Ludes is uh, from Salve Regina University's um, Pell Center for International Relations and Public Policy. Uh, and um, I had his bio up on the screen for a little bit before it turned to Indian food. I don't know why that is, Jim, <laughs> but it switched to Indian food. But so it's I'll, all spicy. It's very spicy. That's right. Um, so, uh, do you prefer to be called by Dr. Ludes or Jim, or does it just it Jim is fine? Jim, okay. Um, so Jim has a, a really awesome background. He's the executive director of the American Security Project, a think tank in Washington, D.C., a uh, member of President-elect Obama's transition team. Uh, he participated in the agency review, review team working inside the Department of Defense to identify critical issues that would need to be tackled by the new administration. Very exciting. Um, he ran the confirmation team for the Department of Defense nominees selected for the roles of Deputy Secretary of Defense, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, Comptroller, and General Counsel. He was a legislative <laughs> assistant to Senator John Kerry for Defense and Foreign Policy and coordinated defense policy issues for Senator Kerry's 2004 presidential campaign, assisting in the development of policies on military end strength, force structure, and improved benefits for military families and veterans. I know we have a few veterans on this call. Uh, he was editor in chief of the National Security Studies Quarterly, a defense and national security journal, editor and contributor of Iraq Uncensored, and co editor of two previous books, Attacking Terrorism in 2004 and 21st Century Proliferation in 2001. He is a native of Manchester, Connecticut, uh, and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and was a Manfred Werner seminar participant in 2000. So we're very excited to have such a well-qualified speaker. And I will um, I'll turn it over to you, Jim. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, folks, I just wanna say uh, hello. Uh, it's a treat to be with all of you tonight virtually. I'm actually just up the road. I actually live in Framingham, Mass. So I'm, I'm closer than Newport, uh, but uh, still we're all responsibly socially distanced and I'm just grateful for the opportunity. Uh, what what, what uh, Michelle didn't mention was that uh, she and I have known each other for well longer than either one of us wants to admit. Uh, uh, and uh, you guys have got a great new innovative and creative leader in Brookline and I think you're going to like working with Michelle a lot. Uh, so Michelle, thank you so much for the invitation to join you tonight. I'm going to share my screen. I've got, I, I, I sat down today uh, to look at uh, what I wanted to share with you guys tonight um, and I found that I have now more than 350 slides on this particular issue. I am not going to show them all to you tonight, uh, but I picked some that I think tell a story uh, about what happened in 2016, uh, that I'm a historian by training, I, uh, got my PhD in uh, history from uh, Georgetown, uh, and I, I, I approach these issues with a historian's perspective. I want to know what came before. I want to understand the context, the historical context within which these things are happening. And I, from that, I want to try to draw some lessons about what we might expect in the last two months of the 2020 campaign and beyond. Uh, so um, I'm going to share my screen, if I can do this right. Everybody see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Super. It's okay. So um, here we go. All right. So uh, 
I mentioned I, I got my PhD from Georgetown. I wrote my dissertation on the Eisenhower administration's use of something called political warfare. Uh, it's basically a broad toolbox of, of statecraft instruments, information, uh, covert operations, uh, uh, influence campaigns that the United States used against the Soviet Union. Uh, and I, you know, I, I loved that topic. I worked on it for much longer than I care to admit. Uh, and I found that it was singularly unhelpful in meeting women. Uh, but in the summer of 2016, uh, as news began breaking about WikiLeaks and a number of other things, I was reminded of some things that I had studied 20 years previously when I was looking at the work of the Eisenhower administration uh, and, and the CIA in particular when it came to, to covert influence campaigns. Uh, and uh, so inspired by that, I took a look at what Russia was doing in the summer of 2016, and I published an article in a, in a defense journal called War on the Rocks um, it, right before Election Day 2016. Uh, it, it piqued an interest that I had had since my earliest academic training, uh, but it's a set of issues that I had not really paid much attention to because, as Michelle had mentioned, I, my career had just moved on to other things as the Cold War ended and, and other issues began to pop uh, facing the United States. But after this article, I tried to pull together a, 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 a conference at the Pell Center at Salve Regina University uh, the next day, uh, the next uh, the next summer. And we brought together about 40 uh, really great experts from the, from the social media companies, regional experts about Russia, um, uh, uh, journalists, working journalists, uh, and folks who had some experience actually with these dark arts of political warfare. Uh, and we produced a, a, a short conference report called Shatter the House of Mirrors uh, that, that sort of described our best conclusions about what had happened uh, and how the United States might want to respond. We uh, released that in October of 2017. And if you don't want to read the Mueller report or the five volumes from the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, you can read this 18 page report and I think get the gist of what happened. It has really stood the test of time. So um, our key conclusions were that Russia is engaged in a well-financed and determined campaign to undermine democratic political and social institutions, as well as international alliances, and to remove resistance to Russia's foreign policy objectives. That's their first objective. We also concluded that Russia is motivated by a resentment about the collapse of the Soviet Union and determined to give itself a freer hand at home and abroad by undermining the political cohesion of democratic states in the West and between them, including uh, institutions like NATO and the European Union, importantly, institutions that do not include uh, Russia. Their principal means goes back to the Cold War and even before is political warfare, disinformation, propaganda, computational propaganda, something important and relatively new in 2016, and support to fringe elements in Western countries. So uh, in the next uh, 25, 30 minutes, I'm going to just run quickly through some examples of what Russia did uh, and some examples of what they're doing right now. Uh, and then I'd be happy to take questions uh, either throughout or at the end. Uh, feel free to speak up and I'd be happy to, to, to either elaborate or tell you the answer's coming. Um, so just as a foundational issue, though, I always think it's important to say, let's define some of our terms. And so when I talk about political warfare, people say, well, what is war? Isn't war political in and of itself? Well, war, a classic definition of war is political violence between two or more states. Now, this isn't some philosophical question that's actually very practical and very relevant to the current state of world affairs. So what is war? On, on one very basic definition, it's this, political violence between two or more states. The problem with that definition is that we have in recent history experienced two major epics uh, that we have referred to as war that don't neatly uh, fit that definition. Uh, the first, of course, is the Cold War, uh, which uh, certainly had an element of armed violence, and it was between two principal camps. It was principally an ideological, uh, we might even call an information war. Uh, and while violence was plentiful in the war on terror, the image on the right here, our adversaries were not nation states. 
Again, these aren't philosophical debates. They're very practical. How do you know how to wage a war if you can't agree on what constitutes a war? And if you don't know what constitutes a war, how do you know that you've won? So through most of American history, just click here, there we go. For, uh, for, through, through most of our history, we've understood war as really being the application of armed force against another adversary's army. It's the breaking of military organization more so than the breaking of anything else. This is a, an image from the, so, uh, from the so-called highway of death uh, in the 1990 uh, Iraq war, uh, Persian Gulf War. Um, this is something that the US military is really, really good about. We've spent a lot of money being able to target uh, 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 enemy formations, uh, ships, planes, uh, armored uh, vehicles, uh, and destroy them. Uh, from at, from at range, whether by air or long range fires from the ground or at sea. Uh, and this is something we're really good at. But this was 1991. In 2003, American air superiority led the United States military uh, uh, to the gates of Baghdad in just a couple of weeks in the second Gulf War. The problem is that that war didn't end when we had captured Saddam Hussein. In fact, the fighting has gone on for uh, more, almost two decades since. The issue is not whether or not we can break another adversary's military. It's whether or not we can break their will. That's where wars are fought. And this is something that Karl von Clausewitz, the classic Ru uh, Prussian uh, 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 military strategist and theorist had, had written extensively about victory and warfare is not about the breaking of organizations. It's about the breaking of will, the will to fight the will to carry on. The question becomes, well, how do you do that? And now historically, if you think just back to the Second World War, uh, it has been about the massive application of firepower. So at the end of World War II, the industrial heartland of Europe, the industrial heartland of Asia was destroyed. Really only among the modern industrial economies, the United States stood unscathed at the end of that war. But the end of that war saw something else too, and that was the ability to, to, to take one bomb and to destroy an entire city. And you have to remember that by 1949, the Soviet Union had the bomb too. So for a generation of political and policy leaders, avoiding another hot war or shooting war meant a third world war that you would want to avoid was a pressing concern. But the question wasn't that simple because the Soviet Union was the antithesis of Western freedom and liberty. So for policymakers in the United States and in allied capitals, the question really was, how do you confront the Soviet Union without risking another major war? The answer they came up with very cleverly was Cold War, lowercase c, lowercase w, not the epic, but a suite of tools that I would classify as political warfare. Now, this isn't just an American uh, concept. Uh, the Soviet Union and its operators adopted the same approach to conflict with the West. Oleg Kalugin is one of the most senior defectors to the United States from the Soviet Union. And you can read his quote here, particularly the, the, the language that's highlighted in gold. He talks about active measures to weaken the West, drive wedges in the Western community of alliances, uh, sow discord among allies, weaken the United States in the eyes of the people of Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, right? So it's, it's really about uh, subversion from the inside, getting people to question their own government, the integrity of that government, the, the reliability of that government, and also weakening the perception of the United States around the world. All right, so I gave you all that as, as background uh, because it moves us into the world that we are today. The president of the, of, of the Russian Federation today is Vladimir Putin. Uh, he is, uh, uh, came of age during the Cold War. Uh, early in his career, he joined the KGB, uh, the Russian Intelligence Service, uh, and he was uh, trained in a lot of these tactics and techniques. After the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, he reflected on one night in particular in Dresden, Germany, where he had been uh, the head of the KGB office there, when uh, mobs of Germans had, had, had uh, threatened to raid uh, his compound uh, and exposed all of the KGB secrets therein. Uh, it, Putin's biographers have pointed to that, that moment again and again as a moment where he grew to fear the street, the masses. Uh, and so anything that would threaten stability and order was seen as dangerous in Putin's mind. 
and is reflected in his leadership as later in 1998, the director of the Foreign Intelligence Service of the, of the new Russian Federation. And since 2000, with a little hiatus in between when he was prime minister as president of Russia. So the Soviet Union ceased to exist in 1991, but those tactics, those techniques, and I have to say, a lot of the personnel who were running those operations for the old Soviet Union, they didn't go away. They moved on to other things. Putin's objectives uh, are a free hand for Russia domestically and internationally. He wants to eliminate institutions that he sees in opposition to Russia. NATO's part of that. The European Union is another part of that. Really, any community of democracies. He wants to weaken transatlantic ties. Any community of democracies that excludes Russia is dangerous to Putin. He wants to eliminate the economic sanctions that have been imposed on him by the United States and the West for things like the invasion of Crimea, uh, for electoral interference in, 19, in 2016, and so on. He also wants to weaken the political cohesion of Russia's primary rivals, states that are internally fragile or weak or divided or less likely to be a threat to Russia on the international scene. Ideologically, he favors personal relationships over institutional relations. Now, all of this is, is relevant because it gives you a sense of the palette of instruments that he's gonna be willing to draw from. This is one last guy I wanna to mention to you. His name is General Valery Gerasimov. He's the chief of the Russian general staff. In, in a relatively obscure Russian technical defense journal in 2013, he wrote an article uh, that conceded that Russia probably could not match the United States in military technology or defense spending, but that Russia could employ political and informational tools to achieve strategic effects. And those included, and I'm quoting here, the use of technologies for influencing state structures and the population with the help of information networks. So what we're talking about on the spectrum of conflict, uh, if you think about uh, counterinsurgency down here and major theater conventional war like either Persian Gulf War up here, well, we're talking about something down here in this gray zone, ambiguous, maybe even a little bit off the chart. Nuclear war would be off the chart on the other side. We're talking about this blended area where some of it seems like traditional diplomacy. Uh, other times, this is just really more about uh, espionage and subversion. So let me give you a couple examples from, from history. I wanna make sure I'm keeping track of time here so that I don't just prattle on and on. I could talk for three days on this. Um, in 1959, the Soviet Union uh, launched a false flag operation uh, to sow doubt in NATO about the denazification of, of West Germany. The key thing in all of this is that, uh, well, so let me just tell you. So uh, three Soviet, actually East German intelligence operatives would have crossed the border from East Germany into West Germany. They visited three villages, three towns, and on former Jewish synagogues or other uh, properties that were associated with the Jewish community prior to the Holocaust, they painted swastikas on the entrances. Those swastikas in those three communities uh, suddenly spread. Once that taboo of that symbol had been broken, there was a wave of swastikas that swept across Western Europe all the way to the United States. My cat wants to say hello. This is Mr. Darcy. Excuse me, well, <laughs> Mr. Darcy. Mr. Darcy. He was supposed to be locked up. Um, that wave of swastikas swept across Western Europe, made it all the way to New York Harbor. Uh, but it began with uh, this, uh, this intelligence operation by East German uh, Stasi operatives in West Germany in 1959, because what they wanted to raise doubt was whether or not denazification had worked whether or not West Germany could be a faithful part of the NATO military alliance, which, were they, which they were about to join uh, the, command, the integrated command structure in 1959. That lingering resentment and anger uh, about West Germany and in Western Europe, Germany and Western Europe, lingered. That wasn't something that the Soviets had to create. They didn't have to invent it. They simply exploited it. And that's a critical feature of all good political warfare. This is an example of language from the CIA's field manual, field manual in 1949. And it emphasizes that you should exploit existing issues because there is no greater thing to exploit as a political operative than something that people are already concerned about, right? You don't create new issues, 
you select with care weaknesses which already exist and insist upon them with artful suggestion and reminder. Artful suggestion and reminder, okay? So if you were going to exploit an open wound in American society, if you wanted to pick at something that has bedeviled the United States for generations, something that we just can't get our arms around, what issue would you pick? Racism. Racism, right? Race. That's, that is our original sin. So uh, there are countless examples of the Soviets and now the Russians exploiting America's racial divide. I'll give you a few examples from the 20th century. Uh, these men, uh, African-American men, uh, were known as the Scottsboro Boys. In 1931, they were on a train uh, in Alabama and two white women accused them of raping them. Uh, there was a lynch mob. Sheriff deputies broke up the lynch mob before they could, uh, before they could murder anyone. Uh, and there were three trials. Uh, after the second trial, one of the women admitted that she had made the story up, that it never happened. Still, after the third trial, all nine African-American men were convicted and sentenced to lengthy prison sentences. The case became a cause celeb of the, uh, of the injustice and, the, and, the, and a common touch point for the American Communist Party, which we know, because we've seen all of the Soviet archives after the end of the Cold War, uh, was not just encouraged, but actually financed by Moscow. So that's the 1930s. Fast forward to 1960. November 1960, African American and Asian delegates to the United Nations all received the same threatening letter signed by the Ku Klux Klan. The offense was so terrible that one African delegate read it into the record of the General Assembly. The letter was headed, White America Rejects a Bastardized United Nations. Now, I'm going to spare you the, the actual language in the letter that was sent because it's really quite offensive. But you can imagine, just use your worst imagination and you're probably close. Um, the issue is, though, that this letter didn't come from the KKK. It came from the KGB, but they were exploiting America's racial issues and the racial animus in American society to, in this case, make the United States look bad to the rest of the world. I'll give you one more example from the civil rights era. Martin Luther King. The Soviets hated Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, he was uh, uh, somebody who, had, who, who spoke eloquently and passionately not about conflict between the races, but about finding reconciliation, about America living up to the ideals of its founding. Soviets didn't want that. Soviets wanted open race war. They favored a, a series of African-American leaders who were much more confrontational, much more willing to talk about violence in the streets. Martin Luther King Jr. was not willing to do that until he was murdered. And then all of the papers that had slandered Martin Luther King Jr., calling him an Uncle Tom, uh, reporting on extramarital, extramarital affairs, all suddenly made him a great martyr because they hoped in his death he could provoke the race war that he would not promote in, while he was living. This is something that the Soviets would go back to again and again and again. Uh, and, and they did it even in 2016. So they had four actions that they undertook in 2016. First is they used military intelligence services to boost the candidacy of Donald Trump. Uh, this is not a partisan talk. You know who I've worked for and what I've done, but this is documented and well understood. And if you don't believe me, you can listen to the Republicans on the Senate uh, Select Committee on Intelligence who have reported this exact same thing. And if you want to see evidence of it, look at the timing of the first WikiLeaks dump relative to the release of the Axis Hollywood tape. This was tactical, uh, but it was also strategic from Russia's perspective. They also used military intelligence services to undermine the candidacy of Hillary Rodham Clinton. Uh, uh, and if for that, you just look no further than the release of the Podesta emails in the two and a half weeks before election, uh, before election day. Um, they used military intelligence services to probe election infrastructure. I'll say a little bit more about that uh, if we have time here uh, in the next few minutes. And then they used social media troll farms to micro-target Americans with divisive messages. It's this last issue, issue number four, where the Obama administration really underperformed. They missed number four entirely. We really didn't get a full understanding of this 
until sometime after election day. So let's talk a little bit about that number four though. Uh, so this is a picture of the uh, nondescript uh, office building in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, that is home to the Internet Research Agency. Uh, in the summer of 2015, a really great young reporter by the name of Adrian Chen uh, did a, a New York Times Magazine report on this agency uh, and reported that he had collected a list of trolls, troll accounts that he knew were being maintained and operated by the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russia. And they had uh, tweeted out a wide variety of issues. But in December of 2015, so six months after he had published the story in the New York Times Magazine, he reported in, an, in another essay that he goes back periodically to check on what are the Russian trolls up to this week. And by December of 2015, and I'm quoting here, he said, a lot of them have turned into conservative accounts, like fake conservatives. I don't know what's going on, but they're all tweeting about Donald Trump and stuff. That's December of 2015. So, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that the Internet Research Agency operated a troll farm that pumped disinformation into the American electorate through social media in a variety of different matters, exploiting a number of issues, including racism. One of their most successful accounts was called Blacktivist. It had 360,000 followers on Facebook, surpassing the official Black Lives Matter account. Its commentary was a combination of showing police violence on African-American men and uh, trying to provoke protests and rallies uh, to criticize the police. Um, this is an example. Uh, th these pages have all been removed, so these are old screen grabs that I have. Uh, but this shows you an example of what they would show. This was a police officer who had apprehended an African-American man. And you can see the description. Uh, we live under a system of racism and police are directly letting us know how they feel and where we stand. This was not a black man in Baltimore. This was a Russian troll in St. Petersburg, Russia. I'll give you another example. This is a tweet from Blacktivist. Uh, black people should wake up as soon as possible. Black families are divided and destroyed by mass incarceration and death of black men. Now, this is not to say that there aren't legitimate claims and concerns in the African-American community about police violence. It is to say that those legitimate claims are being exploited on social media by America's adversaries. In 2016, this was a prominent 360,000 followers on, on Facebook alone. Uh, they were spotted, Blacktivist was spotted uh, when the members of uh, uh, the family of Freddie Gray, Freddie Gray, you may remember, was a man who uh, died in the back of a police uh, paddy wagon. Uh, after he'd been apprehended and then carted around the city of Baltimore. Uh, riots ensued after his death. Uh, on the anniversary of his death, these uh, Russian uh, internet trolls tried to organize a march um, in Baltimore. When the family reached out to say, um, who are you? Uh, they disappeared. Then another uh, researcher uh, noticed that one of their geotagging, uh, they, 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 sometimes your tweets will show uh, where you were when you tweeted it. Uh, someone didn't realize that they left their geotagging on and it noted St. Petersburg, Russia. And that's how that unraveled for, for Blacktivist. Um, even Pokemon Go was exploited. I don't know if you, if you remember this. My kids played it a little while. Maybe your kids or your grandkids did. Uh, but Pokemon Go was a game that you played with your, with your cell phone and an app that you would find these uh, 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 augmented reality characters, Pokemon characters, in various places and you would capture them. According to this game, Pokemon Go characters were living at each of the places where African-American men had been killed by police. And if you captured uh, all of the Pokemon Go uh, characters at those shots, took a screenshot of them and emailed them to the people who were perpetuating this, this, this contest, you could win a $25, a $75, or a $100 Amazon gift card. Right? There was no contest. This was just another way uh, for Russian intelligence to poke fun, or not poke fun, but to exploit the fact that uh, we're still divided around race. Other issues that they exploited uh, was uh, 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 LGBTQ issues uh, in the community. Uh, this is, you can see, interesting. The cost of this was uh, 3,000 rubles. Yes, they paid for these ads in Russian rubles, but they were designed to target uh, American voters uh, in key uh, periods of the election. Um, one of the recurring themes through a lot of this is secession. 
um, uh, the Texas, uh, so when it looked like Senator Clinton was going to be, or Secretary Clinton was going to be the next president of the United States, a lot of the Russian content focused on Texas seceding. After Donald Trump emerged the victor, uh, I don't have these slides in here today, but after Donald Trump emerged the victor, a lot of effort went into the Yes California movement, uh, which was a, a Californian secession movement that was uh, originally organized, I can't make this up, in Moscow. The, the Californian who organized it had married a Russian woman and was living in Moscow when he started the petition drive to get California to secede. Um, another, uh, uh, this is another theme here, get ready to secede, uh, Killary Rotten Clinton. This was October 26th. So Texas, get ready to go, we're leaving. Uh, their goal was to undermine the political cohesion of the United States. So this continued after the 2016 election. In fact, after the election day was over, uh, the number, the, the, the relative proportion of Russian bought media ads that played to race issues increased. And so that was, um, there are lots of examples of this. Uh, I'll show you a few here. Um, this is from an account called Brown Power. Be proud of our heritage. Uh, and it, what you'll see is some of these things, like, well, they, they seem like actually kind of nice messages if you're a member of the immigrate, of the immigrant community except the real target of these audiences isn't the immigrant community, it's the people who are opponents of undocumented immigrants, right? So this is say, be proud uh, that you're an undocumented immigrant. Be proud that your parents crossed the border. The idea is to trigger people with, uh, with, with the fact that you're celebrating this uh, and, and provoking outrage in that respect. Another common theme, the role of, uh, of, of race and uh, Islam in America, uh, this is something that we would see again and again and again. This one, uh, you know, trying to provoke uh, concern and anxiety over the fact that there was a, a black Muslim policewoman who wore a hijab in, uh, in, in Minnesota, of all places, right? Uh, and there, there are more examples like that, um, all playing to issues of, of race and identity. Um, let me give you a couple more recent examples, and then we can, we can open it up to some questions. Um, since uh, 2017, 2018, any time that there's been divisiveness in American society, uh, from the ridiculous, like whether or not football players are kneeling for the national are kneeling for the national anthem, uh, Russia has been active in social. Russia has been active in social media trying to, to stoke tensions around that issue. Every time there's been a, a mass shooting, uh, they've been active around Second Amendment issue rights. Let me be clear: they don't come down on one side or the other. They play both sides of the issue because the issue there isn't about one side winning. It's about stoking tension and getting Americans uh, to be in conflict with one another. Uh, here's some example of, of some, uh, again, another Russian uh, internet meme about uh, how the media would portray uh, the Second Amendment or uh, whether or not, you know, we've got race. Uh, we've got gun violence. We've got the Second Amendment. We've got the mainstream media being, uh, you know, warped judgment. Um, it's it, they kind of they got a, a lot of uh, big issues there. More anti-immigration stuff about uh, deporting families. Um, uh, 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 factually inaccurate claims comparing Obama and Trump. Um, and now a lot of people see when when I do this presentation, say, you know, that's 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 a lot of evidence you've gathered there, Jim. Uh, but are you for real? And I say, yeah, I'm for real. In fact, um, this is something that shouldn't surprise us. Back in uh, 2013, the MIT Technology Review wrote this story about how big data was going to save politics. And it's kind of funny in retrospect, but the issue is that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they aren't just social media platforms. They are delivery systems for precision guided munitions of the mind. Because social media is uh, this great thing. We've, we have uploaded our entire psyches, our entire psychological profiles to social media and we react. And every time we react to something that they do, they track it and they get a more clearly defined definition of who we are as individuals. In 2014, uh, there was a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of a 700,000 person study of users on Facebook. Researchers at Cornell University uh, surreptitiously, so without anybody's consent, uh, uh, assessed with Facebook's cooperation whether or not you could have emotional contagion uh, through social media platforms. In other words, you think about someone who has a very 
powerful personality comes into a room and they are in such a great mood, everybody's in a great mood. Or they're in such a bad mood, everybody's in a bad mood. That's called emotional contagion. It's a documented, understood psychological uh, phenomena. The question was, can that happen on social media? The answer Cornell found resoundingly was yes. We can manipulate your mood and your sentiment by what we put into your social media feeds. Now, this is big money to Facebook because that's the core of their entire business model. It's called psychographic targeting. It's the way advertising is done today for everything from uh, the, the kind of detergent you use to your politics. So they know everything about you and they can draw some big conclusions about what kind of appeals are gonna work for you. The Russians understood this and they exploited this with a very small investment. In uh, 2019, researchers at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville reported that approximately every 25,000 additional IRA retweets, so internet research agency, that troll farm in St. Petersburg, every time one of their disinformation tweets got 25,000 retweets, that predicted a 1% increase in the election opinion polls for Donald Trump. They're able to look at the data in retrospect and see this pattern emerge. That's very specific. 25,000 retweets of an IRA disinformation campaign gets you one additional percentage point for Donald Trump. That means there's a metric. That means there's a scale. That means that the Russians would know precisely how much weight they would need to put on the scale to be able to alter an election. Now, that seems a little bit tinfoil hatty. I know that. I concede that. But as I was reading that study out of the University of, of Tennessee at Knoxville, I was reminded of a presentation that I had heard uh, from uh, a scholar at, the, uh, 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 um, at Oxford University's uh, Computational Propaganda Project, um, which is part of their Internet Observatory. Uh, and this is the study. You can read it yourself. It's, it, it goes on for about uh, a dozen pages. But it basically reports that there was a surge of disinformation into the state of Michigan in the week before the election in 2016. What caught my attention here was that in the final public opinion poll, uh, which was a public policy poll uh, the week before election day 2016, Secretary Clinton led Donald Trump by a rate of 50 to 44, right, with a 3.2 percent margin of error. Donald Trump won the election in Michigan by 0.23% of the vote, 0.23%, just 10,000 votes. So the question then becomes, was there enough noise uh, in uh, Michigan to be able to drive the results? Now, this is speculative. I don't have a smoking gun here, but I find this particularly compelling because the election results moved 6.23% from the final poll to the actual results. The University of Tennessee at Knoxville says 25,000 tweets equals a 1% gain for Trump. There were, a, you would need 155,000, almost 156,000 tweets to get that kind of election swing. Look at how many tweets there were about politics in Michigan the week of, before election day. Oops. There were 13 million tweets. If you subtract out all the stuff and just get down to the stuff that's about political news and information in Michigan, it's 1.1 million. There is sufficient noise to signal ratio to lose what could have been a very successful Russian disinformation campaign in 2016. So one of the other things that they wanted to try to do was undermine our confidence uh, in our electoral process. The Senate in their multi-volume study has documented that all 50 states had their election systems probed. Let me say that again. All 50 states had their election systems probed. In Arizona and in Illinois, they basically held their hand on the cursor over the, the spot where they could change the data in the system long enough for people to spot it and then didn't change it. I'm not talking vote tallies. I'm talking voter registrations. That's important because at the same time, the Russian Internet Research Agency was launching this tweet from an account they controlled called Tennessee GOP that said thousands of names changed on voter rolls in Indiana, police investigating, voter fraud, except it didn't happen. On the one hand, the Soviet uh, GRU, the, excuse me, the Russian GRU, the military intelligence agencies, were in a position to do just that, but they didn't do it. 
This tweet is an example of an active measure to try to raise anxiety about the integrity of America's elections and try to make us doubt in our democracy. So I wanna skip through a couple things here. Let me just say that this is not just happening in the United States, it's happening all over the West. Um, I wanna say really quickly, just a couple words about exploiting the coronavirus and then I will take some, uh, be happy to take any questions. Um, so uh, this isn't, we're living in the midst of a legitimate pandemic. Uh, nearly 200,000 Americans are dead. Uh, we are uh, faced every day uh, with this new reality that we're living in, which is why I'm not standing in front of you in a library, but we're, you're, I'm coming to you from my house and you're coming to me from your house. Um, but Russia is exploiting the coronavirus. You would expect them to. They don't have to create this issue. It's here and it's affecting all of our lives. But this isn't Russia's first time uh, stoking anxiety about uh, a, a, a disease. So in the 1980s, uh, since the 1980s, HIV, the virus that uh, causes AIDS, has infected 75 million people around the world. 32 million have died. At the height of this, in the 1980s, Soviet intelligence planted a story in an Indian newspaper. Now I'm, I'm talking about the South Asia, India. Right, uh, it was a it was a newspaper controlled by Soviet intelligence, uh, and the story basically was that the HIV virus that causes AIDS, which was then newly discovered, uh, had been created by the United States uh, in, uh, in in a lab, probably a CIA lab, maybe a DoD lab, uh, and it had been designed to uh, control the African and the African American population and the homosexual populations. Uh, that story, this is before the internet, before tweeting, before social media, uh, that story was published and quickly forgotten. Then a couple of years later, it started getting some mileage. Uh, papers, uh, first in India, then across South Asia, then spreading to Europe, reported on the reporting about this story, about uh, this idea that the American government had created the virus that causes AIDS. Uh, eventually, it was reprinted or rebroadcast in over 80 countries and in 30 languages. At the height of the AIDS crisis, the story did tremendous damage to US credibility around the world and at home. And at least one study found that almost 50% of African Americans believed that HIV was man-made. As late as 2005, 20% of African Americans believed the virus was man-made. That all began with a Soviet disinformation campaign on the other side of the world. In 2001, when the H1N1 uh, fl uh, swine flu affected 1.4 billion people and a little bit more than a half million people died, uh, Russia Today featured a series of uh, what they called American investigative journalists, Russia Today being one of the Russian's uh, disinformation outlets, who claimed that the virus was again engineered in US government labs, including the Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases at Fort Detrick, Maryland. Uh, on Ebola, they did the same thing in 2014. They featured a pathologist who claimed that the Ebola outbreak was part of a U.S. biological weapons test run amok, uh, and they cited uh, even the 1980 HIV AIDS story. Um, this is an example of a tweet uh, that w came from a Russian account. A lot of the elegant artwork has been uh, stripped away uh, in the archiving, uh, but you get a sense of that there was this account and the message was not in the, the most decipherable English, but it says basically that the government think the folk public are so gullible. They know that ISIS and Ebola is government made and the terrorist threat also government made. So again, not great English, but this was a Russian IRA account uh, that tweeted this on January 31st of 2015. Um, other things that they did around the Ebola virus is they exploited, uh, again, American racism uh, when a couple of cases of Ebola came to the United States, they actually took over a Fox 5 Atlanta website and planted fake news stories. This one basically, and the one that follows, contests that uh, Atlanta doctors uh, at Emory University Hospital refused to treat a black Ebola patient. Um, uh, again, playing to race, playing to this idea that this is uh, uh, America's greatest weakness. Since 2015, uh, Russia has been very active in, in, in supporting the anti-vax, the anti-vaccine movement in the United States. Um, and, uh, and, and again, they're going to play both sides of this issue. But here's an example. Uh, 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 Tanner's dad uh, is the name of the account. 
And it's, uh, it, it's, it's, this was a trending uh, hashtag for a while, CDC whistleblower. Um, uh, they didn't create content. In this case, they just retweeted it. Uh, and, and this was an anti-vax proponent and then later drew attention and support to it. Um, the American public, uh, the American Journal of Public Health actually published an article on this issue, weaponized health communication, Twitter bots and Russian trolls amplify the vaccine debate. And I'll just give you a quick sense that uh, all of these uh, bars in uh, black and, and dark gray give you a sense of the frequency with which the word vaccine or vax or V-A-C-C occurs in Russian bot uh, uh, Twitter activity. Uh, it's frequent. Um, and again, they played themes on both sides, both pro-vaccine or, or in this case, anti-vaccine and pro-vaccine. The idea is that they don't really care one way or the other. They just want us to not have faith in our government. They don't want us to have faith in our public health officials, and they don't want us to trust one another. It is insidious warfare at its best. So I could go on. I'm going to skip through a couple of different things. The big thing around coronavirus right now is this myth that George Soros and Bill Gates working with the CIA engineered this vaccine, excuse me, engineered uh, this virus because they control the patent to the vaccine. And uh, they are going to make a fortune off of this at the, with the help of the CIA and the deep state uh, to be able to make uh, a lot of money off of a lot of death. Finally, the last thing I'll say with you is that just last, uh, last week, actually, uh, researchers at a company called Graphica, which is doing tremendous work on this, um, identified a Russian disinformation campaign around an online news source called Peace Data. One of the things that's new in 2016 is not just the social media is different, uh, but they are using American authors, American authors to help uh, create the stories uh, and, and highlight the stories that uh, show us at our worst. Uh, so they're paying 200, they were paying 200 to $250 per article uh, in publishing stories like, oh, I should say, these were two of the editors. What's really neat about their images is that they were created by artificial intelligence. These aren't real people. Uh, these are synthetic images that were created by a computer. So there's nobody that you could trace it to. These are completely made up individuals. Um, these were supposedly the editors of Peace, uh, of Peace Data. But these are some of the articles that they published in Peace Data. Racism, militarism, and capitalism go hand to hand in the USA. How unprivileged end up fighting for their rights on the streets. A couple, a couple of others. Selfish approach to handling a pandemic. This one's a criticism of NATO. This one is an idea that the European Union is going to start its own army, which is a tense, sensitive issue in a lot of European uh, uh, countries. The U.S. Poli policy of interference is fueling tensions in Europe. And then a, a, a critique of the leader of the Belarusian uh, opposition saying that she's little more than a Western regime change puppet. Uh, so this were written by Western journalists working, uh, they thought, for an independent news agency. In reality, uh, they were... Uh, uh, working for Russian intelligence, or working for Russian disinformation experts. Look, the bottom line is that Russia wants to break up the EU. I think that Russia wants to break up the United States. Uh, I think that Vladimir Putin in particular sees the United States as being responsible for the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, an event he calls the greatest strategic geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And that's saying something. Uh, and I think that he sees, and he certainly has people around him who believe that the destruction of the United States, the, the, the destruction of the Union, uh, it would be in Russia's best interest. So I'll leave it at that. I've talked much longer than I wanted to, uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. And if you want, I can go into how we can uh, spot, uh, spot some disinformation on our own. Yeah, Jim? Yes, sir. If you can spot this information, uh, why can't we stop it before it gets started? I mean, you're, you're, you're able to identify all these various things that Russia is doing. Why can't we yeah. catch it before they do it? Well, we're better. So in 2016, we uh, honestly, I don't think that the folks in the intelligence community really appreciated how pervasive the use of, of, of social media was as a delivery mechanism for these things. Now, I think that there's greater sensitivity, but we run into a thing called the First Amendment. Uh, we have this critical tension in our system where we prize the freedom of speech. And so then we have to question the integrity of uh, people who are posting on social media. One of the things that we recommended in Shatter the House of Mirrors that 
mention that that report that I mentioned at the top of the lecture uh, was uh, the ability of the social media companies, they probably need to be regulated. Uh, there was a lot of churn over this in 2017 uh, in terms of uh, that, that, that if you were buying political advertising on social media, you needed to be identified the same way you would if you were advertising on WBZ, right? Uh, they don't have to do that. The, 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 the social media platforms said that they would police that themselves. Congress didn't act. I think Congress needs to act. But beyond that, I think each of the, of the social media platforms probably need to move ultimately towards a real ID mechanism, where if you're posting on social media, you've got to show your face, you've got to show your name, particularly if you're politically active, uh, because it's the only way to ensure that uh, you're a real person. We have already seen in this case of peace data that they're creating avatars. They look like real people, good looking people at that, but they're not real people. And it, it's, it's a way of circumventing and exploiting our technological prowess. Now, there are tools out there to spot those kinds of things now that didn't exist in 2016. But there's an offensive defensive race that's ongoing uh, where uh, every time we think we close off one door, they're going to find another way to exploit it and, and so on and so forth. What that leads me to really is that each of us, each of us as users of social media, as consumers of news, we're not just consumers of news now, we're also purveyors of news. And so every time we think, excuse me, or every time we tweet or retweet or post something on Facebook or Instagram, we need to be mindful of, is this legitimate? Is it from a legitimate news source? Is there three questions that I tell my students to ask when they're uh, when they're when they're considering a source to put in a paper for me. First question is, is the argument valid? Reflect on the argument, reflect on your own bias. Is this just confirmation bias? You found somebody that says what you wanted to say. And so bam, that must be true. So is the argument really valid? It, who's their intended audience, right? Uh, are they trying to find, are they trying to target a very niche in the American populace? Or is it for a much broader general audience? And finally, who's the author? Uh, and is their author, is their argument authoritative? So take a look at the author's byline. Who are they? Would they be in a position to know? Do they have credibility on this particular issue? Uh, if you can't answer uh, uh, each of these straight facedly, then probably skip tweeting or retweeting or posting on Facebook that piece of information. Uh, because it, it, we're ultimately all responsible for our, our own information ecosystem. And we've got to be in this together because it's just too big for the government to handle on its own. I had, I had posted a question earlier. Was uh, it in the chat? All right, yes. Um, and it was, it was basically, I, I kind of threw it out uh, because of frustration yeah. and, and said, is there anything we can do? But, but the follow-up question that I also posted was, will anything be done until we can get the occupant of the White House out? Well, um, look, so I, 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 uh, I, I think that there's a lot of effort taking place already uh, inside the, the, the U.S. government bureaucracy around this issue. Uh, in 2018, we did not see a Russian offensive going into those midterm elections. Um, and there was a lot of speculation about, well, why not? And what we know, and this is, this is the truth, what we know now uh, is that um, the National Security Agency mounted a covert operation to basically take the internet research agency, that nondescript office building in St. Petersburg, Russia, where the Russian trolls operate out of, took them offline. Uh, it was a it was a, an operation that uh, was launched in the days before election day 2018. Uh, it succeeded in bringing them offline for a period of weeks, long enough for American for the American election to move forward. I suspect there'll, there'll be some cloak and dagger stuff like that in 2020 as well. Um, uh, but I think fundamentally, uh, there are a couple of things that have to happen. I mentioned our own individual responsibility. The other thing that we have to look for is uh, will our news uh, 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 will, will our source, will, will professional news gatherers be more responsible about disinformation this time? The reality with the WikiLeaks, with the stolen emails, uh, was that uh, major American Pulitzer Prize seeking news outlets, who are the ones I typically trust, had this on the front page of their uh, newspapers and their websites every day for months because it was newsworthy, it was relevant. 
but they failed to consider were they being used as part of a foreign disinformation campaign. This was a question that we put, we had some folks in the room from major media news outlets when we did this conversation in 2017. And we, put, we asked them point blank, has your employer learned from this and understand the responsibility that you have as, a, as, as the keeper of the news uh, to say, hey, you know what? This is newsworthy stuff, but we think it's part of a foreign disinformation campaign intended to influence our campaign. In 2017, they weren't sure how to answer that question. I think based on the way I see the reporting unfolding this year, that that lesson has been uh, better understood and better internalized than maybe we give it credit for. So I think a long-winded answer. I don't know if I answered you, Leslie. You, you did, um, and I just want to throw out quickly a great thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I need to move on to another Zoom, but I wanted to thank you before I left. Thank you for joining us. Take care. I do have a question here that was sent privately from Jude. Um, why isn't it common knowledge that this is being done, and why aren't the actual facts out there? Uh, who oversees this kind of intervention? Whose job is it? Um, you know, I, so I spent a lot of my career working on a lot of different national security issues. Um, and, and one thing that I know is that the country becomes uh, focused on a national security issue uh, when the bipartisan leadership of Congress speaks with one voice about the seriousness of the threat. Um, there's a, a study from the Triangle Institute, which is down in North Carolina in the 1990s that made that point about the use of force. I think that if you had a really uh, bipartisan effort to expose what happened in 2016 and what is continuing to happen to this day, um, and I mean like a 9-11 style commission investigation of this, uh, you could get some consensus around this issue and it would stop being a political hot button issue uh, about fake news and you're just trying to destroy the president and you really get back to say, no, we're actually trying to protect American democracy. Um, then I think that there's probably a basis for some bipartisan movement around, around that. Uh, Senator Richard Burr from North Carolina, Republican chairman of the Senate Select Committee of, uh, uh, for Intelligence until just recently, uh, was actually a real patriot about this issue. Uh, and he took a lot of heat from uh, members of his own party and from the president about uh, his leadership of that investigation. Um, but that investigation is really solid. Uh, but to your point, Jude, a lot of Americans don't, don't read it. I might um, just use that as an opportunity to, to uh, plug uh, this uh, open source and free newsletter that I publish every Saturday morning at 8 a.m., uh, it's called Active Measures. It's a newsletter of political warfare, influence, and information campaigns. If this stuff interests you at all, send me an email to this address here, jim.ludis at selve.edu. I'd be happy to add you to that list. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a weekly compendium of the most important reporting on this set of issues. We try to keep it between 10 and 20 articles that we've seen that resonated with us. Uh, this is actually our second anniversary. So this is our 104th issue going out uh, this weekend. Uh, but if you're interested, let us know and we'd be happy to add you to the list. I can send that out to everybody, Jim. Um, you know, after, after this, so, so folks have um, easy access, you know, to your, to your email. Um, I, I have a question that, you know, I, I've often wondered, you know, why, if the, if, if foreign governments interfered in our election in 2016, why was the election considered a legitimate election? Like at what point yeah. should somebody have said, we need to go back to the voting booths and do this again and make sure that it is really what the American public wanted or. Right. Uh, well, so I don't, so there, there is, so there's a new book actually out on this issue and it's called Rigged. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's, um, the author is a, is a young man by the name of David Scheimer, uh, who's done a wonderful job of looking at the last century's worth of covert election interference by the United States and the Soviets and now the Russians. Um, the news that he made in publishing that book is that um, according to four sources that he talked to, the Russians were in a position to change vote tallies on election day. Let me say that again. The Russians were in a position 
to change vote tallies on election day. But there was no evidence that they did so. Where the Obama administration, I think, missed the mark uh, is that they failed to consider that you could change votes without tinkering with ballots. You could change votes by hacking the human brain, which I would argue is essentially what the Russians did, which is why I think that those numbers and that data out of Michigan is so compelling. Um, but Americans still voted. Uh, if you were influenced uh, uh, by uh, an advertisement that you saw on Facebook, or if you're advertised by uh, a debate that you watched on Fox News or CNN, it doesn't really matter. You still made up your mind and you voted. So there was no evidence of actual ballot tampering uh, or vote stuffing. So the way we operate uh, elections in the United States is they are all run by the states. The states certify that they're legitimate and valid if they do then the system moves forward. And there was nobody who questioned the integrity of the vote. Uh, there's just really in retrospect, a realization that there was more going on to hack our brains than to hack our, our ballot boxes. Prior to the election, um, when, bear with me, um, when the Obama administration found out what was going on with the Russians, Russian yeah. interference prior to the election. Yeah. I think they didn't want to uh, be accused of putting their hand on the scale in terms of saying, this is going on now after That's WikiLeaks a, yep. and those things. That's absolutely want, right. They, in they, fact, they, 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 what they had hoped actually was to get, uh, I mentioned the sort of the bipartisan leadership of Congress. Uh, they went up and they briefed the, the, the chairman, excuse me, the, the, the majority leader in the Senate and the minority leader in the Senate, the Speaker of the House, uh, and the uh, majority minority leaders in the House. So that's the that's the bipartisan leadership of the House of Representatives. And according to media reporting, it seems that Senator Mitch McConnell accused the Obama administration of trying to interfere in the election to make it political. And he basically warned them point blank, if you go public with this, I'm going to say you're trying to rig the election. And you remember Donald Trump at that time was already saying it's going to be a rigged election. It's going to be a rigged election. Like, he, the, like he's saying now. <laughs> like he's saying now. Uh, the, the Obama administration was highly sensitive about protecting the integrity of the election. They wanted to avoid that. And so what they stood up was a, a, an aggressive cybersecurity uh, operation in the White House, at the National Security Agency, and at Homeland Security to be able to respond if they saw ballot tampering taking place on Election Day. They saw none. They didn't say anything, but again, they failed to appreciate that you could change votes by changing minds. And that seems to be where the bulk of the effort. I have one friend who follows the stuff as closely as I do, who actually thinks that that, that uh, Mike Pence tweet that I showed you about election, uh, election tampering and the fact that they were in a position to change voter registrations, but did not, um, was all a distraction that the Russians knew all along that what they wanted to do was to, to, to influence voters in an influence campaign, not actually try to stuff the ballot box. One of the other things that David Scheimer uh, explores in his book is the idea that uh, the Obama's administration was worried about Russia escalating. They weren't changing voter registrations yet, although they, we knew that they were in a position to do so. We knew that they could potentially change vote tallies, but they hadn't done so. There was a concern that if the United States confronted Russia before Election Day, Russia would have escalatory dominance and could go after vote tallies on Election Day. And the other thing that you have to keep in mind, really, is that at the end of the day, uh, I think the Obama team thought Hillary's going to win. And she will clean up the mess afterwards. We just got to get it through Election Day. She lost. Most of us did. <laughs> it's a true statement. Hmm. You might find this interesting, Jim, um, when I tried to um, post an ad on Facebook for this lecture, Facebook rejected it. <laughs> they, they rejected it and they said um, it, it, it um, went against their community standards. Yes. Yeah. And like it was a political because it was, uh, I don't know, it had something to do with, with, with it being political and um, of a, a social issue. Yeah, you know, and, and one of the things that I, I try to be very studious about, I've been doing the, I'm doing a variation of this talk now for 
for well, four years. Uh, and I, I try to be very, very cautious and careful in uh, talking about this in as apolitical a manner as I can. Uh, because fundamentally, this is not about who the president of the United States is. This is about preserving the republic, right? This is about, 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 uh, about, about you know, uh, defending this birthright that we are blessed to have as American citizens, but is not guaranteed. Ronald Reagan was right when he said that, you know, uh, uh, democracy is, is only one generation away from being destroyed by tyranny. Uh, and, and this is where we are in this moment. Uh, if we don't fight and, and, and defend this thing that, that we really take for granted at our own peril, uh, we could wake up one morning in a very dark place. Um, the forces of, uh, of, of, of tyranny, uh, if I can use that word, uh, are, are on the march, not just in the United States, but around the Western world. One of the slides that I, that I breezed by uh, is about the popularity of democracies around the world. Uh, and it's absolutely stunning uh, how unpopular um, democracy is. I'm not going to find it right now. But the, but the, 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 the upshot of it is, is that the, the further you get away from the World War II generation, uh, the more likely you are uh, to say that it's not so important that you live uh, in a democracy. Uh, and I, I just find that alarming in the extreme. As the country has become divided, uh, more so along political lines, along racial lines, yeah. um, a number, through a number of fault lines, um, I, I think the root cause, going back to a lot of this, is money. Yeah. In term, or money for, or power. Inequality of any kind, whether it's inequality financially, inequality in terms of our rights, inequality in terms of our privileges as citizens, anything that sort of can breed resentment is, is, is a fault line. Um, we, you know, I, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine earlier today who uh, was saying that, you know, she was wondering whether or not, uh, you know, the United States and its long history has got a lot that we need to answer for, quite frankly. Um, there was this moment after World War II where we did some real good in the world. Um, and we, got, we started to get our own house in order with the civil rights movement. Uh, we saw freedom prevail around the world with the end of the Cold War. Um, but now we seem to be reverting back to the, the kind of country that we were prior to 1945. And that country is, is, is racist, it's ugly, it's, it's driven by nothing more than the, the mighty dollar. Uh, it doesn't stand for ideals except for when it's forced to in something like the Civil War. Uh, and we're led by a bunch of uh, uh, marginally competent tyrants who are in office for four years, many of whom got themselves rich in the process and then they go on to, on to other things. Um, we've got to have a better story to tell than that. Uh, we've got to have a better narrative. We need to be able to recapture the idealism of the American founding and really realize that we need to make those ideals real every day. That's my, that's my soapbox moment for the night. Yeah. Jim, you did not mention China at all. Is the same type of uh, uh, thing happening from China as there is from Russia? It is. And I've got another 80 slides on that that I, that I glossed over here. But um, the short answer is yes, they are. Um, they, uh, they have a slightly different approach. They're not using, well, uh, in the United States heretofore, they have not used influence the way the Russians have. Uh, in Australia, they absolutely have. And Australia is grappling right now with what their relationship is going to be with China, realizing that a lot of their institutions, including a lot of their higher educational institutions right now, are essentially infiltrated uh, by China. Um, uh, there, China has taken a long view perspective on its relationships in that part of the world and even globally, uh, and it sees its ability to, 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 to leverage its great wealth its manufacturing capacity, uh, and its relative political stability in terms of its foreign policy uh, to really uh, its, 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 own, uh, its own purposes. Um, they have in, 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 uh, in Australia right now, they have an ongoing 
tit for tat, if you will, uh, where they have expelled Australian journalists, Australian journalists working in uh, working in China uh, because of uh, perceived offenses in the in the Australian coverage. Uh, so it's not so much about uh, pumping disinformation into Australia as it is curtailing the flow of information. Um, and that is essentially what a lot of these battles are about is who can tell their story more effectively to more of the target audiences as, as than the other side. Um, in the United States, China has uh, used influence uh, in sort of a traditional diplomatic sense. Uh, there is an intelligence estimate out this summer that, yep, the Russians still would like to see Donald Trump win, but the Chinese would like to see Joe Biden win. Uh, the difference in, in, in the approaches, though, is telling. Russia is using all the kinds of tactics that we've seen here today. Uh, in, 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 in China's case, it is less about uh, pumping information or disinformation into the United States than it is about a, a generally held belief amongst Chinese leaders that Biden would probably be more predictable, uh, more likely to, um, uh, to operate by the rules of the international system, which the Chinese economy is predicated on and which ours has been predicated on since 1945. Um, and from that perspective is, is generally in the better interest of China than a second, uh, than a second uh, Trump term. But we haven't seen the kind of disinformation uh, that, that Russia has used. The one um, other place where they're really using influences is around um, uh, COVID diplomacy, basically. Uh, China, with its massive industrial capacity, has been churning out PPE for the rest of the world. And they've been very, very prominent in shipping those PPEs with great fanfare and celebration all over the world. Uh, we uh, who live up here are very mindful, probably all remember the moment that that uh, New England Patriots jet 757 landed at Logan with PPE from China. Uh, and uh, Robert Kraft and, uh, and Charlie Baker were both quick to thank uh, the Chinese diplomats who helped make that deal possible. Uh, the Chinese are doing that all over the world, and they're gaining political leverage in Eastern Europe in particular, uh, and across a belt from Eastern Europe uh, through the Horn of Africa, across South Asia, and across Central Asia with an initiative they call a Belt and Road Project. And they're basically recreating the old Silk Road and stitching uh, the old uh, pan-Eurasian trade routes back together again for the 21st century. So they're playing a long game, they're playing a smart game, and they're using their foreign aid and investment dollars very strategically for that purpose. Very interesting. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate all this information. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with everybody tonight. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Michelle, if uh, folks want to sign up for that newsletter, just have them send me their email address. I'd be happy to... Uh, to add them to the list. And otherwise, I, I thank you all. I wish you all great health uh, and, uh, and safety in the midst of this pandemic. And I hope that we'll have an opportunity to be together again sometime in person. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Good night. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.